Ben Motorcycle Adventures Podcast, your hub for everything off-road, dual sport, and adventure motorcycle. My name is John. I will be your host. This is episode number 14, Ben Motorcycle Adventures Podcast. Thank you for joining. Thank you for listening. Tonight on the show, we have Justin Lewis. He is the marketing director for the OMRA. That is the Oregon Motorcycle Riders Association, OMRAoffroad.com. Justin is here to talk to us about all things OMRA, racing series, dual sport series, the annual banquet that's coming up, um, you know, right to ride, keeping trails open, land use issues, all the things that the OMRA is essentially immersed in, he will cover tonight. Now, on the backside of this podcast, for those of you who have never participated in the OMRA racing series or been to any of the events, I will walk through most of the 2019 rounds, kind of describe the venue and the terrain. Um, I've been to most of them numerous times. There might be a new one on the schedule that I haven't uh, attended, but I've been to most of these venues. So this is a great podcast, kind of a preseason podcast for the OMRA, but also very informative for those of you contemplating coming out, racing the series, riding some of the events. I can kind of give you a heads up on um, you know, what to expect. So without further ado, let's talk to Justin Lewis, Marketing Director for the OMRA. Thanks for listening. I want to bring you on the podcast for, okay. for a couple reasons. Obviously, you got the 2019 season coming up, and this is a good way to promote that. And I know, you know, having having been a, a referee for the OMRA, you're going to get a lot of questions from, you know, people who are thinking about coming to the events for the first time and things like that. So I thought this would be a good uh, a good forum to discuss that. Um, and, you know, you being the marketing director for the OMRA, uh, I thought you could talk talk a little bit initially about – you know, some of the things I, I think most of us, when we think of the OMRA, we're thinking racing, but you guys do a lot of other stuff too, right? Yeah. I mean, we're trying, you know, I think we've been trying. Uh, so there's, you know, a bunch of initiatives around that. There's a bunch of initiatives around like work party, trail building days uh, and whatnot. And then obviously there's the full sort of spectrum of just fun, you know, fun events and whatnot outside of racing. Um you know, it is, it is tough though. I will say like racing can really dominate the OMRA, um, which isn't a bad thing because the majority of our membership is, you know, our folks that come out and race either the GP or XC series. Um, but I think we've been trying to find ways to continue to just diversify that membership base and provide more value. I think the legislative stuff though, honestly, is probably the, the kind of silent thing that, you know, there's a handful of folks that work on that. I'm always, I'm always impressed by what they know about what the state's doing and, you know, what they, the insights they have into sort of public land. So. Yeah. They kind of have their ear to the ground as far as those topics go. Probably one of the most important things, you know, the OMRA backs and represents too. But like you said, it, uh, it's kind of one of those silent things. (laughs) Yeah, it can be that a little bit. I mean, I think in, a few years ago, two years ago, I think we did a good job of donating a good good chunk of money to the uh, Okacho, I think is how you say it, you know, sort of, you know, land use fight a little bit. And we donated a good amount of money to the MRA to purchase the additional land down there. So there's some good stuff that happens. It's just, you know, it's 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 not on the same cadence that the race calendar is. So I think, you know, <laughs> the race calendar can just kind of dominate the all the things we talk about and, you know, we do, we do everything we can just to keep up with that, like posting our results and promoting the event. So right on. Yeah. I didn't, I wasn't aware that you guys had contributed to the, to the Ochico thing over here, which I think is still kind of a work in progress. That's interesting though. Yeah. I mean, that's the kind of stuff that I think we've been trying. I mean, honestly, we've been, we've done better as a, on the financial side, I think since I got involved in the OMRA, we've done a pretty good job, I think, being good stewards of the of the limited money that we sort of bring in. Um, but, you know, we do a pretty good job between the racing memberships and the sponsors that come aboard and the club sanctioning fees. You know, we pretty much take that sum of money every year and we just do two things with it. We take about 40% of those dollars and put it back into trail related um, 
efforts, whether that's purchasing land or purchasing equipment to improve land. And then we use the other 60%, you know, for. They use the other 60% for, you know, things like the banquet promoting the, uh, the racing series and, and things of that nature. We lost Justin's call for a second, but I will fill in the gaps as needed. That's pretty much it. It's a pretty simple budget. Um, but I think that sort of 40, 60 split has been a nice way to, use some of the money for something outside of racing that we all benefit from. Sure. And, and again, it's good to, to uh, get that word out and let people know that, Hey, that, you know, the money that you spend or uh, you give to the OMRA, you can donate to it, It's being, uh, you know, it's, it's being put to good use. It's, it's being put to keep your trails open and maintained and, and again, fight legislation to keep our areas open. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, I think it's interesting. I mean, since, since I've been in Oregon for a little while now, but since I moved here, it's like, you know, I think there's this, this feeling at times that, you know, OHB areas are, uh, are right <laughs> that we have to the <laughs> state government. And the reality is, is that, you know, that's a lovely thing to believe, but you can believe that right until the point where your last riding area closes. Um, so I think you got to kind of go on the offense a little bit and be more proactive than just, sort of hoping that your tax dollars are going to, uh, cover everything. So yeah, I think that's why we do it. And that's, that's a great point. I've had the luxury of, of meeting some people from different States this year and, and taking them on tours around here. And I'm here to tell you the majority of them don't have writing areas like we do. A lot of States are locked up. It's all private. Um, you know, we actually have, we have over 50 OHV areas in Oregon. We've got it pretty good. Yeah, we do. I grew up, you know, I grew up in Michigan and lived, on the East coast for a really long time. And, you know, basically two places where there's just, there actually isn't even a concept of like public lands, um, especially on the East coast. And, you know, so even if you wanted a riding area, if you lived in a place like new England, there's just, there's no place to do it. I mean, the state doesn't own anything. Um, so yeah, I think we're, you know, we're pretty fortunate out here to have just these massive pieces of publicly owned lands. And then, you know, have the sort of multi-use rights to co- continue to use them. And, um, yeah, I think we got to stop and recognize how lucky we are. So, yeah. I, I think to kind of, to wrap that up, I read something the other day, Oregon is like the, uh, the, the fifth has the, the fifth most public lands by, you know, percentage of square miles in the United States out of wow. the 50 States. So again, pretty fortunate there. Uh, um, yeah. I want to flip this on you. Let's talk a little bit of racing. Yeah. 2018 season, you had eight uh, XC events. You had eight GPs. Uh, kind of a, a lot of the, uh, I don't want to call them the, the usual events, but a lot of the the same locations and venues. But I did notice that you had a, a race at Huckleberry Flats this year. How'd that turn out? I think it did really well. Nora did an amazing job. Uh, Dan Hart you know, in particular, I think did a really good job with the rest of the club, bringing that race to that venue. Um, it was a fun event. It was a woods racing cross country event, which we don't get a lot of. Um, so it was, it was really fun. And I think a lot of people turned out that weekend just to race something new and riding different venues is, is, you know, not only fun, but something that we're trying to really, uh, you know, promote as being one of the, you know, important parts of the series. Yeah. And I think it's, it's important too. now you guys have a GP down at Clark's branch. You've got a race cross country race in Medford, but, uh, to bring another, another event, you know, XC specifically down to kind of some of the Southern parts of Oregon, a lot of the races are to the North or you have a couple mm-hmm. of central Oregon, but you know, without the, uh, the old funky chicken, it, you don't have, yeah. you know, I, I think it's good to kind of, to blanket certain parts of the States. And you're obviously going to get people that, that live nearby that may not go to other events. So I guess it would be good exposure for you guys overall. I think we're continually trying to sort of push out and figure out how do we, how do we get to some new places? And then, you know, probably also like, how do we continue to mix up the formats and whatnot to just kind of keep, keep the racing really interesting. Yeah. And then the same thing, like you mentioned with the formats, you've got, you've got, uh, obviously you've got the GP series, which are, you know, they're a little bit shorter races, a little bit of, for the most part, sometimes motocross, light motocross mixed in with off-road. And then you've got the sprint enduros on the schedule too, right? 
Yeah. So this year for 2019, we're going to, we've actually folded the sprint enduro series. Okay. Um, it, you know, it, it didn't get the world's greatest turnout. Um, that's for sure. And I think partially it was a, it was a four race series. You know, they were, they were kind of all over the place in terms of location wise in the state. Um, but what we've done for 2019 is we took the lamb fear sprint enduro and we're going to fold that into the cross country series and run one sprint enduro format as a part of the, you know, eight race cross country series. And I think it will be interesting. It will kind of add a, a different flavor of an event. Um, I think part of the problem we're having with the sprint enduros, honestly, is that people weren't coming out to realize how much fun they are as a format. And yeah, for those who haven't, who haven't uh, participated in a sprint enduro, what's that format look like? What's the day look like? Yeah. I mean, it's a fun day, you know, I mean, it, it basically, uh, the way that the majority of them have been ran is that you kind of split up into two groups, you know, double a expert riders and then sort of, um, then, you know, women, uh, beginners, uh, seniors kind of split into another group. Um, and you essentially do three tries at the same lap in the morning. Uh, and then you do three tries at an opposite lap in the afternoon. And so at the end of the day, your, your score is the total of those six special test times. Um, and those special tests are pretty interesting. They're usually about a 15 minute sprint. Um, so it's not a terribly <laughs> long, not, I mean, it's a, it's basically a moto. Um, so you go out and you sprint hard for 15, maybe 20 minutes and, uh, come in and regroup and look at, you know, look at the other guy's score or whatnot, and then go out and do it again. So yeah, yeah it's a, it's a fun format. You get a lot of breaks. You still end up riding a lot of miles, you know, by the end of the day, but you don't notice it in the same way as you do on a, you know, three hour, uh, XC. So, yeah. And it's a little more intense too, right? I mean, you're in a, you're in a timed, uh, test, if you will, special test, uh, it could be 15, 20 minutes and, you know, you can't, you want to push it, but you can't make the mistake. So, uh, maybe yeah. a little bit different than your standard XC where, you know, under some circumstances you settle into a good pace and, and try to last three or four hours. Yeah, that's it. I mean, I know a lot of guys, you know, they've been racing for a long time. They really appreciated the sprint enduros because it was a, it was honestly a chance to work on a portion of their racing that you don't always get to do in an XC. You can't really go out and, you know, operate at that pace for, you know, hour after hour. Um, so it, it's kind of an interesting event that I think actually makes you a better rider. It makes you faster on the bike it kind of gives you this like isolated period of time to just like really focus in on, on your, you know, how quick you are around something that you've seen one or two times already. Um, so yeah, it's a fun format, honestly. It's just, uh, we need to do a better job probably kind of promoting it and hopefully having it a part of the XC series. We'll, we'll do that. We'll just get, you know, more folks turning out to it. So. Okay. Now, this this question seems to come up a lot, or it's come up a lot throughout the years. You got a, a new rider that's considering coming and, and maybe riding one event or sign up for the whole series, and they always say, "What class should I sign up for? What would your what would your rebuttal <laughs> be for that?" Oh man, the, the, we get two two popular <laughs> emails to the OMRA is, uh, "What class should I sign up?" and "Can I have my dad's racing number twenty five?" Uh, they, <laughs> It's like everybody's dad had the number 25, I think. And, um, yeah, I, you know, I think classes are pretty straightforward, honestly. It's like, if you're new to racing, you know, you're going to have a better experience coming out and being a little conservative, you know, it's like, if you're, if you ride a good bit, I think coming out and racing, you know, in the am class makes a ton of sense. Um, I think you'll have a good experience and you won't be sort of overwhelmed by the, pace or the aggressiveness of the riders around you um you know and and i think even the same is true it's like if you're pretty competent on a bike you just don't know drop into a beginner class you know race and it's better to race and feel good about yourself than to go out there and and get whooped really good and go home you know feeling feeling like you didn't do a great job so I think, you know, being conservative about the class and sort of joining a race and seeing where you measure up is, 
probably the right way to right way to do it. And then, you know, in a, in a season or two, if you're, if you're in the top five consistently, uh, then, you know, you think about, okay, do I bump up to an expert class or whatnot? And, um, I will say for myself, I raced to am, you know, when I, when I started for, I don't know how many every years. And when I, when I bumped up, I was glad I waited until I did. Yeah. I experienced the, the same thing years ago. The guys, uh, right on a whole nother level. And then in the meantime, you've got your double a guys that are just, uh, <laughs> yeah. just, just untouchable. So, yeah. But yeah, I, yeah. I think for starters, you know, if a guy's got to ride the beginners, good place to start. And you know what, if you're blowing everybody away, you do the right thing, move up. There's no, you know, there's no shame in that. So. Yeah, exactly. But yeah, I just think it's like being a little conservative. I, I feel like it gives everybody a, a a better experience if you will and and you know the other thing i would say if a new rider listens to this you know maybe don't make devil's head your first event um <laughs> you know it's uh we, we've seen a couple of those in the last few years and and we've seen actually a couple new new racers not new riders come out and have devil's head be the first race they've ever done and they finish and they love it um but it's a hard event you know i think lone wolf and devil's head are, are tough to finish um, you know, within the time block. So, you know, if you're coming out to one of those, like, you know, being in the race and accomplishing those events is a win. Uh, you don't have to come out and, you know, worry about where are you finished, just come out and have fun and, you know, finish, a, finish a race and you'll feel pretty good about yourself. So, yeah. And I would echo that Tillamook state forest, Trask, Jordan Creek, diamond mill, wherever, wherever the, the races are held in 2019, really great woods riding, but it is, it's very technical. Um, and yeah, those, those races are, are tough. I think, yeah, it's, it's an honor to, to finish. If you get a gold or if you, if you luck out and get the win hats off. But, um, I I think that's one of those things you just, you just go in knowing that it's going to be a tough long day and you prepare mentally for them, but, um, great events run by great clubs. They never disappoint, you know, you're, no. you're the trails you get a ride. A lot. I'll tell you, these guys do a lot of work and they open up a lot of stuff that, that hasn't been open for years just for these events. And the riding is just killer. So always, yeah, circle, so always circle those on the calendar. Yeah, those are, those are super fun. Stepping away from the actual events a little bit, you guys have your, your annual bank banquet Excuse me, coming up on the 26th. What can you tell us about that? Yeah, I think it's going to be a fun event. I mean, we, you know, we've had a fairly fairly low brow banquet the last several years um you know and it's been good but i think you know we've we've had pretty good turnouts at the banquet for the last few years and we were packed in some sort of tighter venues if you will um so this year we decided to go to the world of speed um it's a great venue it's got plenty of space um you know we've sort of upped the ante a little bit on the food and the catering and whatnot um so i think you know all in all i think it's got it can be a really great you know venue and event and and really the benefit of that banquet i mean if you come and you're receiving a trophy it's great it it feels pretty good but i think you know it's just a good opportunity to come and get to know the other racers and riders and whatnot and hang out with a bunch of folks that love dirt biking um so we definitely you know we we urge everybody to come that's a part of the omra or anybody who frankly just loves dirt bikes um, I, I think it's a pretty good event and a good experience. And, and I think honestly, racing in general too, it, you know, racing becomes infinitely more fun when you are kind of a part of the community or racing. Um, and the, and the banquet's a good opportunity to come and really get to know somebody without a bunch of gear on, uh, and, and without everybody being in a hurry to go somewhere. Um, so yeah, it's a lot of fun. No, I hear you. I haven't been to I haven't been to a race in I don't know a year and a half or so. I think that's part of the reason I like to do it though. It's the the community, the camaraderie. It's it's just a lot of, of fun to go to these events, see some of the 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 same faces, and then obviously I love the the riding and the racing and the competition. But um, it is like a, a it truly is a small community. Yeah, it is. I mean, you know, it's it's interesting. We've done we've actually done a pretty good job in the last few years of getting a lot of new riders new to the omra riders and racers out to the events but you know at the same time there's this kind of like 30 percent if you will of the membership that is just insanely committed 
Um, and they're at the majority of the events. They race, you know, they race at the GPs and the XCs. Um, and you know, those folks, like if you kind of put in a little bit of time, you really get to know one another and you make a lot of good friendships. And, and as we were talking about classes, I think if you kind of settle into a class at some point and race a number of years, um, you know, in a similar, in the same class, you just, you end up meeting all the kind of guys or girls that you race with, um, on a regular basis. And it's, it's hard to not be become really good friends with folks that are willing to go out there and torture themselves alongside you. <laughs> um, you know, so what's not to like about that? Yeah. And, uh, some of the people that I raced throughout the years, we ultimately ended up becoming riding buddies, not uncommon to, to meet these guys somewhere and go riding on the weekend. So, you know, win, win yeah. as far as I'm concerned. I agree. There's something about, you know, when you race with somebody, you kind of, you're, you know, theoretically you all kind of ride at a pretty similar pace. Um, so you end up being pretty good riding buddies because, you know, you're, you're all kind of operating at the same level a little bit and probably with a similar level of intensity about riding. <laughs> uh, so yeah, they end up becoming good, good riding partners as well. And I think that that's, uh, you know, that's, that's one of the kind of joys of getting to know a bunch of folks that are kind of at your age, if you will, and at your same level. So. Okay. Moving away from the banquet, um, kind of a two part question. First thing I happened to come across something on Facebook the other day that said, Hey, if you sign up early or you sign up now or within some sort of time frame, um, you'll, you'll get some sort of insider information on the China hat ISD sign up. Can you speak to that at all? Yeah, I sure can. So, you know, I mean, you know, we've had an issue, obviously, not an issue, but we've had a little bit of a problem, I guess, around China Hat for a number of years now, just being such a popular event. Yeah. Um, and I think one of the one of the challenges is, is, is that, you know, as a really popular event, Lobos, uh, Lobos does a pretty good job of managing it really tightly. I mean, they've always kind of, held the information out a little bit around when sign up was going to happen. Um, probably really in, in an effort more to just try to provide a platform for sort of fairness. Um, but I think this year we met with the club and we did a lot of work and said, Hey, you know, when we have a, a couple hundred active racers, um, you know, OMRA racers, our, our, our worry is that some of those, some of those racers aren't going to be able to get into the event and they're going to have to use, you know, one of their throwout races automatically on China hat. Um, so I think we did a good job and the club was really great and gracious to kind of come to the table and say, Hey, what if we provide, you know, sort of like a seven day early sign up window to active OMRA members and make sure that all of those active members get in, um, and they were willing to kind of make that concession for us. Um, so we'll be communicating, uh, you know, in March when sign up happens with everyone who has an active OMRA race membership. Um, and we'll give all those folks an opportunity to go and sign up first, um, which I think will be really great. And then we've kind of have another little thing in our pocket where um, we have a set number of reserved um, entries as well that anybody that signs up for an OMRA membership between, you know, uh, the first race and, and China hat, which I think is the third race of the season, um, we'll be able to sort of get some of those folks in as well. Um, so I think, you know, we're just trying to sort of solve that issue in a creative way, um, and, and make sure that we can get, you know, all of the OMRA folks into the event and, and allow them to race without losing points or having to do worker points for it. So, um, yeah, I think a pretty, pretty good deal. And I think, you know, a, a good, a good, uh, way to sort of mediate the problem, at least for this year. And we'll see what kind of, uh, what kind of effect it has on turnout. So, yeah. And for our, our listeners, you know, obviously this is, this is a good way to incentivize you to sign up early and get all this stuff taken care of. I'm sure that OMRA just loves getting bombarded with signups, <laughs> you know, the day before round one in Eddyville. But uh, if you're not familiar with the China Hat ISD, it's the, the biggest off-road race in Oregon, and it's capped at 350 riders. You have to sign up online, and most of the time it fills up fast. So if, if you're sleeping on it, there is, a, there is a chance that you may not get a minute <laughs> for China Hat. So best thing to do, sign up early. Get a little yeah. uh, early notice for sign-up is. Get a better minute. 
uh, which sometimes help us helps if it's dusty and just kind of get all that stuff out of the way early on. Yeah, that's it. I think, you know, we'll, we'll get them all done in, in March this year. And I think that will be really great. And, uh, yeah. And I think also, you know, for anybody who's never raced that event, it's a fun event. It's, it's a confidence inspiring event. I would say like if, again, if you're a newer, newer to racing, um, it's a pretty low impact event, like high miles mileage, but low impact. And so it's a fun event to kind of come out and race. I think the ISD format is, is nice in that there's not a lot of like bar to bar racing. Um, and, and it's really fun. So yeah, so get, get yourself signed up and, you know, get some buddies out there to do it with you. Yeah. I always enjoy the ISD events. Most of the time you've, you're, you've got a forgiving schedule. Uh, and you know, unless again, it really does to you make a major mistake, but you know, you can kind of rally at the checkpoints. You can stand around and BS with people a little bit. So it's, it's a good way to meet people too. And, um, yeah, race is usually 90 to hundred miles. Uh, I guess I wouldn't call it technical though. There is something, something to be said for being able to go fast <laughs> and hang it out, yeah. you know, at those speeds, uh, on that, in that terrain. So, um, you know, again, to each their own, it's one of my favorite races, but it is, I, I think for anybody, it's a great way to kind of get, uh, you know, get in line and, and get acclimated to what racing's like here in Oregon. Yeah, we, we agree. And I think that's why it's, it's important to kind of, you know, try to serve the needs of the OMRA and the active racers. And at the same time, you know, keep, keep a, an event in the series that frankly is one of the best ways to sort of onboard new folks to racing. Um, I don't think I've ever met anybody that went to China hat and said, wow, that, that sucked. I'm not going to do that again <laughs> next year. Um, usually a lot of people end the day smiling and you know, it's a good, it's a good experience and it's a lot of fun to race the event. And yeah, and you might get lava rock, you might get snow, you might get, 60 degree and sunny weather you never know what you're going to get and bend in april um which kind of adds to the the fun of it a little bit for sure and it's always cool to look at you know 350 motorcycles impounded and try to calculate the value sitting there <laughs> overnight <It's crazy>. yeah <laughs> and try to figure out how many of those poor ktms aren't going to start in the morning oh, man that's uh, the worst that would be the worst feeling i always got <laughs> i always got off the line but there was a couple times when uh you know, we were 20, 30 seconds in before it started to come to life. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, Justin, I think that pretty much wraps up the, the, the list of questions I had. Uh, where do we go to sign up for the series? Do you do you have any uh, signed up 2019 sponsors you want to plug while you're on? Yeah, Pacific Tractor uh, in Hillsboro is, you know, they've signed up to essentially sponsor the whole the whole series this year is the title sponsor. So we're, we're beyond thrilled about that and really excited to be working with those folks and, um, and really just appreciate it. Honestly, I think, um, you know, we, we have only so much impact and only so much we can give. And I feel like the sponsors end up always giving a little more to us than we probably do to them. And, and not, not for a lack of effort, but it's just kind of the reality of a volunteer organization like the OMRA. Um, so we really appreciate those guys kind of stepping up uh, for that title sponsorship. And then, you know, other than that, really between Facebook and, and OMRAoffroad.com, those are really the two best places to kind of keep up with everything we're doing. Go register for the banquet when you can and come out. And, and you know, I think that's a good kickoff at the end of January just to start getting excited about racing. And then last but not least, you know, put down those cookies and start training because when you <laughs> go and race a dirt bike on, I think it's March 17th, uh, you're going to wish that you probably worked a little harder through the winter time, uh, myself included. So, uh, you know, n no excuses, get yourself, get yourself fit and get out there. Uh, yeah. Nothing, nothing more humbling than, uh, you know, getting 30 <laughs> minutes into a three hour race at Eddyville and realizing that, uh, you're not as fit as you thought you were. And then, you know, uh, a few weeks later, usually you go down to Timber Mountain. Sometimes it can be 75, 80 degrees down there. And oh. you've, been hang you've been hanging out in 45 degree uh, weather all winter. So, yeah, best yeah. to get out in front of that stuff. It is for sure. You have, you have a lot more fun at the beginning of the season if you're if you feel strong than if you try to go to those two races, you know, and not fit. So, yeah. All right, Justin, one more question for you. You got a New Year's resolution? <laughs> oh 
man, I'm uh, no, no, no new year's resolutions. I usually do. Uh, I usually do some like goal setting every year okay. and I haven't, I haven't done them yet. Mine's probably got to be around fitness though. I'm, I'm about to turn 44 and, uh, and you know, I feel like every year I got to work just a little bit harder to get out there and try to be competitive. So I'll, uh, I'll, I'll do everything I can. I- you know, I mean, sometimes, sometimes the best medicine for that, Justin, is just to go out and buy a new motorcycle. That'll make you faster. <laughs> All right, Justin, thanks for coming on the podcast and representing the OMRA. Now some of you have a better idea of what to expect from the racing series in 2019, and you also got the opportunity to learn about some of the other things that the OMRA has done and is actively pursuing. Now for those of you who are interested in hearing kind of my assessment of some of the races on the 2019 calendar, this segment is more for you. I'm going to start with the cross-country series The first round is March 17th, and it is in Goldendale, Washington. The event is known as the Eddyville, the Eddyville, excuse me, uh, cross country. And, you know, what can I say about this, this particular venue? It's uh, more of a European style Grand Prix. The race is going to be two and a half to three hours long. You're going to have, uh, you're going to run multiple laps, probably six to 10 mile laps. You'll likely make a pit stop somewhere along the way. Uh, pro tip here, if it's wet, if it's soft, you're going to burn a lot more gas than, than you might think. Speaking from experience, in 2016, I burned up uh, about three gallons of gas in a, in a GP race there, which was only about an hour and a half long, and ended up pushing my bike back to the finish. It was about, I don't know, eighth of a mile, quarter of a mile. Anyway, if it's soft, it will rob your horsepower, it will eat your gas. Just a heads up, make sure you bring plenty and top off periodically. But again, uh, a very wide course, six to ten mile loops, natural terrain. That's really what you should expect when you go to Eddyville. The second round is the Timber Mountain XC. That's down in Jacksonville, Oregon, near Medford. It will take place on April 7th. Probably my favorite event on the calendar. It's a bummer that it's only a one-day event uh, and no longer two this year. But it's uh, you know pretty awesome. Woods riding, the club down there is, is excellent. Great marking. Um, challenging terrain but fun terrain i don't think you can go wrong with that and again it'll be multiple laps under most circumstances so i've seen laps down there that were up to 30 miles and i've seen laps that were that were 10 to 12 just depends how they lay out the course but it'll be uh it'll be a loop there'll be pits you can drop your gas there and everything and and refuel as needed but uh you know if you can only go to one event that might be the one in 2019 it's a really good it's a really good race and it's a really good atmosphere fun environment April 28th, round three, the China Hat ISDE, another one of my favorites. I've raced it a ton. This is, again, under the ISDE format. You'll have to impound your bike the night before. You'll be assigned a minute. You'll have to adhere to all of those ISDE rules, which the Lobos will send those out in advance, and I believe the OMRA has the rules on their website. But, you know, usually this race rolls rolls out to be 90 to 100 miles. There'll be four quote-unquote special tests along the way. And you will enter those and you will be timed. And the person with the lowest amount of time at the end of the day is ultimately going to win their class, barring you haven't uh, picked up any penalties along the way. So this is, uh, like Justin said, it's kind of a uh, relaxed environment if the schedule permits it. I've been there when I didn't have much time to take a break at the checks or anything like that. But also there's a lot of emphasis on the four tests or two tests if you're riding some of those amateur or beginner classes and you... You can't make mistakes. There is very little margin for error. Again, I've raced out there 100 miles, and I've seen myself and others, you know, separated by just a handful of seconds at the end of the day. So, um, really great event, but you don't want to make a mistake in the special test. Round four is the Landfear Sprint Enduro that's put on by Mount Scott. Justin talked about this a little bit. Honestly, I haven't done enough. I haven't done. This Sprint Enduro, and I've only done a couple up in Washington, so probably not qualified to comment about this, but, but you know, kind of an, an overview of Sprint Enduros. There'll be, you know, one or two sections, lengths of trail, whatever the case may be, marked out that you'll probably ride multiple times throughout the day, and you will be timed in those sections. And, and again, the, the lowest amount of time or points is ultimately going to win the race. Next couple of rounds will take place somewhere in the Tillamook State Forest. Round 5, Devil's Head ISDE. This is a long-standing event, again, put on by Mount Scott. Uh, technical 
Pacific Northwest Woods Riding. What else can I say? These guys usually do a pretty great job. I don't know if it'll be held under traditional ISD rules or the hybrid rules that they've used in past years, but um, you know, just make sure you bring plenty of water, maybe something to eat at the uh, at the checks if you have a chance to snack on something and you know prepare to be challenged for sure. I could say the same thing about um, round six, the Lone Wolf ISD that is put on by the Lobos. Again, not sure what part of Tillamook State Forest that will be held, but um, again, I would I would expect a challenging woods race. But again, the trails are going to be fantastic, and both these clubs do a nice job of of putting on good woods races. Round seven, October twelfth. That is the Cowbell XC. That is in Shed, Oregon. And that's nearby where I used to live in the valley, about 30 minutes from where I used to live. I've ridden there a ton. The uh, The ground, for the most part, is pretty flat down there in that particular area of the valley. There's a lot of trees. I don't know what kind they are, but they will, uh, they'll take you off your bike. I know Gary does a nice job of laying out uh, you know, a good mix of single track and, and grass track and, and flowy sections. He, he puts a lot of effort into this event, so it's definitely one that you don't want to miss, and it's one of the last you know, cross-country races of the year, so... Uh, Got to get out there and, and kind of finish the season strong. The last round of the OMRA X Series, oops, the last round of the OMRA XC Series will be held on October 20th, and that's at Huckleberry Flats. The uh, the the group or the club Nora puts it on. Fantastic club. Sounds like they got some rave reviews about this cross country race. And um, you know we don't have that many you know head to head. Well, I think this is the only one other than. Um, Timber Mountain. So we don't have many head-to-head woods racing events. So this is kind of a nice way to close out the season there, uh, you know, at the base of the Cascades at Huckleberry Flat. So I'm sure that is just a fantastic race. On to the GP series. The first round is, let me take a look here, March 31st, back up at Eddyville. So not too different than the Eddyville XC, other than the fact that, you know, the, the race will be about an hour and a half or an hour, depending on what class you're in. Um, it might be plus one lap. I can't totally remember off the top of my head. You might want to refer to the OMRA rules, but again, um, kind of cite the information I give you about the Eddyville XC. Subtract a little bit of time, and that will be the Eddyville GP. Round two, put on by the same club, different venue, Starvation Ridge. Uh, a lot of the same things apply. Starvation Ridge is pretty open, pretty fast, pretty wide. Um, usually, usually a fun GP, one that I enjoy, but I like to um, you know, ride more out in the open than some people do, and I don't mind the high speeds. Round three is uh, Spoon Creek, and that one is back at Shed where we talked about the cowbell. Again, Gary puts a lot of effort uh, into his events, and that'll be a fun one in the valley, close to Portland, close to Eugene, close to Salem. Great event. Round four, Sugar City GP. That one is outside of Sweet Home, Oregon. Just so happens that is held on land that... Uh, one of my best friends owns. He's put on the event here for a few years now. He puts a lot of time into it. Good, tight, single track, challenging trails. There'll be routes, no rocks to speak of, good grass track, natural terrain motocross, clay base. It's held on June 9th. Uh, you know, if conditions are right, you, you won't find better dirt. You won't find a better event. And I know John puts a lot of effort into that one. So always looking forward to that one. Round five, getting back down to Clark's Branch. That's the Clark's Clark's Branch GP. Wow, I can't talk. Um, June 16th, if you've never ridden at Clark's Branch, it was kind of a, a very popular motocross track back in the 80s and 90s. Now they're allowed to run events there from time to time. Uh, a lot of up and down there. Good place to uh, good place to get arm pumps. So when you show up down there, make sure you're in shape. But that is put on by Ultra. They've run a lot of events in the past. Very good club. So that's a great race. A little bit of a break, and then September 22nd is the Dick Jagow GP, hosted by Mount Scott. They've been doing this GP for a ton of years, and talk about motocross tracks. This one's held at Washougal. It runs through the woods, some pretty tight racing. You get to get out on the motocross track, a good mix of of all those things. I really enjoy that particular event. The uh, Colby Dunn, I've actually never done this one. Um, I know the... It's held at the Flying M. I know a little bit about the area, but I've actually never ridden this one. Uh, you might want to speak with somebody from the OMRA about that one. And then the last round, October 6th, again hosted by Nora. Territorial GP, another motocross track. Eugene motocross track this time, or Territorial, whatever you want to call it. But um, good mix of track. Love the uh, love the clay base there. Usually conditions are 
pretty nice in um, in October, and then you know they just they just mix in portions of the track or all of the track with uh, you know trails and, and grass track that, that kind of surround the area. So you know that's kind of my quick and dirty on on all the OMRA events this year. If you want more information, feel free to email me benmotorcycleadventures at gmail.com. I'd be happy to pick up the phone and talk to you about any of these events. You know, bike setups, terrain, what to expect. I've pretty much been to most of them are ridden in the areas a lot, so I got a, a little bit of a grasp on, on how things are going to go. So I think that will just about do it for this episode of the podcast. On our next episode later this week, another day or two, we'll be talking with the series director from the AMA Western Hair Scrambles. If you're looking at racing hair scrambles or off-road events all over the West Coast, you need to take a good hard look at the AMA Western Hair Scramble Series. Very competitive, awesome venues, contingency uh, you know, professional racers. You can go check out some of the pros and how they handle the off-road stuff. So that will be our next episode of the podcast later this week. BenMotorcycleAdventures.com. Don't forget to visit our website. You can always go to our blog, listen to previous episodes of the podcast, check out some of the written content we have on there. And if you're interested in an off-road, dual sport, or adventure motorcycle ride, that's what we do here at Ben Motorcycle Adventures. You can always check those out. If you have any questions, feel free to contact us. Ben Motorcycle Adventures at gmail.com. With that being said, I think we're going to call it a night and we will catch you guys on the next episode. Thanks again for listening.